I created a patch that allows the PlayStation 3 version of Nier to run at any frame rate. While I was creating this patch, I found an odd pattern in the game's code. The game likes to zero a vector register, then convert that zeroed register to a floating point number. Thing is, unlike all other numbers, the way that zero is represented in binary is the same for both floating point and integer numbers. In other words, the second instruction here is essentially doing nothing. This pattern appears in Nier's code 2434 times. Thankfully, when translating the PowerPC code of the PlayStation 3 to x86, we're able to optimize the floating point conversion away. But I can't show you the code in RPCS3 that optimizes this pattern, because RPCS3 doesn't optimize this pattern. Rather than translating PowerPC code directly to x86, we instead translate to something known as LLVM IR. The open source LLVM project knows how to ingest LLVM IR and output code from many different computer architectures. Since the LLVM project receives so many contributions, simple optimizations like evaluating floating point conversions on a constant value don't need to be re-implemented by the RPCS3 team. This is why when you boot up a game for the first time in RPCS3, it takes so long on this step, compiling PPU modules. An analyzer in RPCS3 finds all of the PowerPC code in the binary, translates it to LLVM IR, and LLVM converts it into well-optimized x86 code. Performing this step before boot helps mitigate any stutters or hitches that would normally occur due to translating the code at runtime. But the core that runs PowerPC code on the PS3, known as the PPU, is pretty much the least interesting part of the PS3. This is a die shot of the PS3 CPU. This large structure is the PPU. It supports everything needed to run a modern operating system and can run generic code. These eight repeating structures are the SPU cores. They're built for maximum throughput at the expense of programmability. There's eight of them here on the die itself, but one is disabled for better yields, and another is reserved by the operating system, so when emulating the PlayStation 3 we only need to worry about six of them. Let's take a look at the SPU manual. I can't read this. Let's take a look at one of the official manuals instead. There's a lot of features that make the SPUs unique, but let's talk about how they handle floating point numbers. First of all, the manual mentions that much of the code base for game applications assumes a single precision floating point format that is distinct from the IEEE 754 format commonly implemented on general purpose processors. What in the world does that mean? Well, it turns out that the SPUs inherit the same crackhead floating point format that the PlayStation 2 uses. In this format, values of infinity and nan are not supported, and are instead interpreted as a number with a very large exponent. Under IEEE 754, any number with all bits in the exponent set are interpreted as either nan or infinity, but in the extended range floating point format, they're instead treated as an exceedingly large number. This poses a problem for emulators, as we need to execute additional instructions to ensure compatibility with PlayStation 3 software. This is what Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2 looks like when we don't properly emulate the extended range floating point format. You can see that most of the geometry is missing. How do we handle it? One method that is common to both PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3 emulators is to clamp the input values down from what would be interpreted as NAN or INF on IEEE processors to FMAX instead. This isn't entirely accurate, however, it is pretty fast. Still, even a fast method adds several instructions to our implementation. What does that look like? This is what the code that emits the clamping instructions looks like, and this is sort of what the resulting x86 assembly looks like. Two instructions isn't a lot of overhead, but considering that the PlayStation 3 is 40 times faster than the PlayStation 2 at crunching through floating point numbers, you still hope for something faster. And so I did come up with something faster. By using the V-Range PS instruction, we only need one instruction to do both positive and negative clamping. The behavior of this instruction is controlled by a constant value. By using the correct constant, we can take the absolute value of our input, take the minimum fmax in our input, then copy the sign bit from the original input to the resulting value. Crucially, the instruction also differs in how it behaves when either inputs are NAN. If either input is NAN, it will use the second input value as the result. Since our second input is fmax, this behavior is desirable. Unfortunately, the V-Range PS instruction can only be used on CPUs that support the AVX512 instruction set, and most people still don't have a CPU that can execute AVX512 instructions. So what does Ninja Gaiden look like with more accurate floating point emulation? The game was missing geometry with inaccurate floating point emulation because the game is performing as much geometry processing on the SPUs as possible. Many games use a Sony developed library known as SPU Edge Geometry for this purpose. 
If we zoom into Momiji's face here, you can see that the game is actually culling triangles that are too small to be rendered at the game's native resolution of 720p. If we switch over to the same footage from the PC version, you can see all of that clear up. There's still one more difference with the PlayStation 3 version. If you shake the controller like a moron, then her boobs jiggle like this. For some reason, they didn't include this feature in the PC version. What the hell? Let's take a look at some specific SPU instructions now. FCEQ or Floating Compare Equal is a pretty straightforward instruction. Take two numbers. If the numbers are equal, fill the result with all ones. If they aren't equal, fill the result with all zeros. There's one issue when comparing to the equivalent instruction in x86, how it deals with NAN values. NAN can't equal NAN, so there's instead two choices of behavior to choose from. An unordered comparison will return a result of all ones if either operand is NAN, and an ordered comparison will never return a result of all ones if either operand is NAN. The simple solution here is to perform both an ordered floating point comparison, along with an integer comparison at the same time, then logically OR the results together. We do this because an equals comparison in floating point is essentially an integer comparison with special cases for NAN and zero, so by combining the results we can get something accurate to the PlayStation 3. Comparison instructions are typically followed by this next instruction, cell B. This instruction takes three inputs. Depending on the contents of the third input, the instruction selects a bit from either the first or the second input. This process is repeated 128 times for each bit in the SPU registers. Since comparison instructions like FCEQ fill the result with a result of all ones or all zeros, this can be used to select between not just bits, but entire 32-bit floating point numbers. But if the SPU registers are 128 bits, why are we talking about 32-bit numbers? Well, the SPUs implement something called SIMD, Single Instruction Multiple Data. This means that instructions like FCEQ actually perform four floating point comparisons and pack the results into a single 128-bit register. This is more efficient than executing four standalone instructions, but comes at the expense of programmability. SIMD instructions aren't something exotic, all modern processors support them. For instance, SSE, AVX, and AVX512 are some x86 SIMD instruction sets that you may have heard of. However, the SPUs stand out by not supporting scalar instructions, instructions that only operate on a single input. Moving back to cell B, how do we emulate it? Well, there's a simple solution that takes three instructions. We need to logically AND one of the inputs, logically AND the inverse of the other input, and then OR the result of those two operations together. With AVX512, there's actually an instruction that allows you to do all of that in just one step. The VP turn log instruction can perform any combination of bitwise operations on up to three inputs in just one operation. But even without AVX512, there's a fast way to execute cell B 90% of the time. The VP blend instructions in x86 will select an entire 32-bit lane of either of the first two inputs based off of the most significant bit of the third vector. Since we know that the selection mask provided for cell B will always be all ones or all zeros following a comparison instruction, the VP blend instruction is equivalent in this case. Let's take a look at the FCGT or floating compare greater than instruction for just a second. We have to execute some extra instructions to match PlayStation 3 behavior just like with FCEQ. There's a special case optimization for this instruction that is able to simplify our emulation to a single integer comparison given that one of the inputs is a positive number. The great thing about this is that LLVM is able to see the pattern of an integer comparison greater than, followed by a select, into a much simpler integer min-max instruction, meaning that we only need one instruction to emulate two PlayStation 3 instructions. Neat. Let's move on to what I consider to be the most iconic SPU instruction, Shuff B. Shuff B or Shuffle Bytes is an incredibly powerful instruction that also sees a lot of usage. Since it's so commonly used, it's important that the implementation is very optimized. x86 programmers may be familiar with the SSE instruction pshuffb. pshuffb means pack shuffle bytes. Since pshuffb is simpler than shuffb, we're going to do this in reverse and explain pshuffb first. First, let's picture an array of 16 numbers and number them in reverse, from 15 down to 0. Then, if we have another array of 16 numbers, we can think of these values as indices, values that will select a result from our other array. So a value of 0 will select a result of 9 from over here. This is what it looks like once the process is repeated for each element of our vector. You'll note that this case resulted in a 0 being written to the result. pshuffb has a special case where it will write 0 to a result if the indices have the most significant bit set. So, how does shuffb differ? First of all, our input array is numbered in the opposite order this time, from 0 to 15. Secondly, we actually have a second set of numbers this time, numbered 16 to 31, since Shuffy takes two 128-bit input vectors rather than one. 
Just like with P Chef B, Chef B has a special case when the most significant bit is set. But Chef B has three special cases in total, allowing some special constants to be written to the result when desired. That's a lot of behavior to emulate. How do we do it? We're going to start by taking the input indices and bit shifting them four places to the right. We then need to take those shifted indices and use them to index into a special constant with P Chef B. We'll now have an array filled with our special constants and zeros for all other values. We'll just hang on to this vector now and come back to it later. Next, we need to XOR the value hex f into the original unshifted indices. The purpose of this is to reverse the order in which we index into the shuff b indices such that p shuff b can match its behavior. Now we need to execute two p shuff b instructions with the reversed indices. This has to be done twice since p shuff b can't take two input vectors like shuff b can. Finally, we need to merge the two p shuff b results along with our special cases from earlier. We need to bit shift the shuff B indices to the left three times and then take advantage of the x86 blend instructions to select from each of our two P shuff B results. Finally, we need to logically OR our special cases from the start into our result. Since P shuff B writes zero in all three of the special cases where shuff B would write a result, the special cases can be cleanly added to the result. This is what the resulting x86 assembly looks like. We need about nine instructions here. Note that I didn't include loading any constants in the instruction count. In most situations, LLVM is able to find some additional optimizations to reduce the number of needed instructions here. For instance, if shuff is used twice with the same indices, it will recognize that it's already calculated the special cases for that set of indices, and will omit calculating it again. Alternatively, if shuff was called in a loop, LLVM would hoist calculating the special cases outside of the loop, such that it's not being recalculated each iteration. Despite the fact that LLVM is able to add so many optimizations by itself, we still have some extra optimizations of our own for shuff -B. Lines of code isn't a good metric to judge code, but just look at how big this implementation is. What I showed you earlier is all that's needed for an accurate implementation, but all this extra code exists to make your video games run fast. We have optimizations for when the input comes from special indice generating instructions that are meant to be paired with shuffb. We have optimizations for when the indices are a constant value, allowing LLVM to simplify the code even further. We have optimizations for when LLVM's known bits analysis can determine that the indices don't contain any special cases. We have optimizations for when the input vectors were recently byte swapped, allowing us to shuffle the unswapped data and skip the step where we reverse the indices. Finally, we have a special AVX512 path. This is the piece of code that I'm most proud of writing in my whole life. Not only is it a real mindbender, it's also blazingly fast. This is going to take a minute to explain, so strap in. Let's take a look at the resulting assembly this code produces first this time. We only need 5 instructions here if we don't count loading constants. The key to all this is the VG2P8 affine QB instruction. This instruction is a real mouthful, and I often see people who are new to x86 programming fixate on this instruction in particular and gawk at the absurdity of that long name. However, this instruction is adored by experienced programmers who have taken the time to learn how to use it. This instruction is part of the GFNI instruction set. These instructions operate on something either known as a Galois field or a finite field. Galois fields are named after the French mathematician Evariste Galois. This doesn't really have much to do with PlayStation 3 emulation, but wow, this guy made a number of contributions to mathematics before dying in a duel at the age of 20. What did you accomplish at 20 years old? What do you intend to accomplish at 20 years old? Anyways, uh, without a background in mathematics, the description for this instruction is pretty impenetrable. This instruction was designed to accelerate cryptography, and the description is appropriate for that audience. But this instruction has become so well known for its potential for non-cryptographic uses that even Intel has produced documentation on how it may be used for non-cryptographic purposes. Rather than plagiarizing what they've written, I'm just going to quote a little bit from the documentation and then follow up with some examples. Intel says, The GF2 field is simply a Galois field with only two elements, 0 and 1. The addition of two values in GF2 is equivalent to addition modulo 2, or an exclusive OR. The multiplication of two values in GF2 is equivalent to multiplication modulo 2, or the logical AND operation. Other operations are similarly defined. So a background in math isn't really required here. From now on, we can simply think of addition in a Galois field as an exclusive OR. Here's an example Intel gives for transforming an input byte. For each resulting bit, we have one input byte, a constant bit, and one source byte. For each bit in the first input, we take a bit from the source byte in the same position. If there's a bit there, set it. Once we've taken all those bits, we horizontally XOR all those bits together along with the constant bit as well. By only setting one bit in each of the first input bytes, we can treat this instruction as sort of a bit shuffle instruction, not dissimilar to how p shuff b and shuff b work. 
All sorts of other possibilities arise, like emulating a sign extension of an odd bit count, or perhaps an 8-bit shift instruction, the kind of thing that's missing from x86 SIMD. Let's take a look back at our ShuffB LLVM code. These 16 bytes are mirrored down the middle, since each set of 8 bytes operates in an independent lane. This byte will select the second most significant bit from our input. These 7 bits will select the third most significant bit from our input. Finally, we exclusive OR each result by hex 7f. What we're left with are the special cases with the ShuffD instruction. We need to take the minimum between our results and 0, because if the second most significant bit of the indices was not set, the constant should be 0. I'm really proud of how this code works. I've been waiting to talk about how it works in detail for several years now. And honestly, I'm so tired of people bashing on GF2P8 affine QB that I'm officially announcing that I will be dueling anyone who talks smack about this instruction from now on. That's right, if you say something stupid, I'm gonna find you and we're gonna duel to the death. Anyways, RPCS3 has some other uses of the GF2P8 affine QB instruction too. But this video is long enough already. Apparently I left some comments here though, so maybe you can figure out how it works without my help. Okay, enough distractions. We're almost done talking about Shuff B. There's just one more part of the AVX 512 path that I want to talk about. This VPerm2B function is unassuming enough. If you're running an AMD processor that supports AVX 512, it will just output VPerm2B, an instruction that takes two input vectors sort of like Shuff B does, just without any special cases. Cool. But on Intel, we instead emulate VPerm2B with a sequence of two instructions. Why? Well, VPerm2B is implemented with three microops on Intel. You can imagine that it looks something like how we shuffle twice and then merge the results when we're emulating ShuffB with pshuffB. But there's a faster way to handle this on Intel, slightly faster. By inserting our second source vector into the upper 128 bits of the first source vector, vpermb actually becomes equivalent in behavior to vperm2b. And yes, emitting all of this LLVMIR magically compiles down to just two instructions. I was unsure if this optimization really would be faster, despite documentation suggesting that it would, so I benchmarked it back in the day. On my Tiger Lake laptop, the AVX2 path had a throughput of 1 emulated shuff B per 4 cycles. The old AVX512 path had a speed of 1 shuff B per 3 cycles. And the latest AVX512 path had a speed of 1 shuff B per 2.3 cycles. Pretty sweet. So, I could spend more time talking about specific PlayStation 3 instructions, but I think by now you understand the type of effort that the RPCS3 team puts into making them run fast. So let's switch subject a little. What kind of impact do different instruction sets have on performance? This is how God of War 3 performs when targeting a processor with SSE 4.1 instructions. The game performs about 30% faster with AVX2 instructions, largely thanks to the addition of Fuse Multiply Add instructions. Another 20% performance is gained when targeting AVX512 instructions. So, when looking for a new CPU, you should get one with AVX512, right? Well, sort of. Depending on the game, the fastest CPU might be something without AVX512 support. And yeah, the latest Intel CPUs don't support AVX512. This is despite Intel creating the instruction set and shipping it on CPUs from several years ago. How come? Well, Intel's latest CPUs have something they call efficiency cores on them. Unfortunately, since the efficiency cores don't support AVX512, the larger performance cores can't enable AVX512 support. Intel is working on a solution to this that they call AVX10. AVX10 is essentially AVX512 but with only 256-bit long vectors. So you can use all the new AVX512 instructions without implementing 512-bit long vectors. Problem is, AVX10 is still several years away from shipping in a client product. AMD recently posted some patches to the open source GCC compiler with details on their upcoming Zen 5 CPUs. One of the new features with Zen 5 is that it can execute 512-bit wide AVX512 instructions in a single cycle. I made an entire blog post on this subject previously, with the goal of explaining exactly why AVX512 is useful for RPCS3, which has nothing to do with how wide the instructions are. RPCS3 does use some wide AVX512 instructions, but since those make up less than 1% of the code executed, doubling the speed won't make much of an impact. However, the other new features detailed in the Zen 5 GCC patches are a big deal for RPCS3, like the doubled L1 and L2 bandwidth. Let's get back to talking about the PlayStation 3 hardware. The SPUs are a pain to program. Part of the problem is that the SPUs execute nothing but 128-bit SIMD instructions. But there's an even bigger problem when it comes to programmability. The SPUs cannot directly access main memory. Why do they do this? Let's check out how a conventional machine loads from memory. First, we execute a load instruction which generates an address. Next, we need to translate that address from a virtual address to a physical address. The mapping for translating addresses is held somewhere in memory, but it would be too slow to look that up each time. So address translations are cached in something called a translation look-aside buffer. 
Once the address is translated, the processor will check if that address exists in the caches. Typical modern processors have three levels of cache. Finally, if all level of caches didn't contain our address, the processor makes a request to the memory controller to load the cache line that contains our address. That's an extreme amount of complexity considering how common load and store instructions are. On the SPUs, load and store instructions are quite simple. Once the address is generated, the processor loads the data found at that address. There's no virtual to physical translation, and there's no caches to check. Each SPU can only directly access 256 kilobytes of local storage, which is made up of SRAM similar to caches on other CPUs, but without the complexity of having the hardware manage evictions and fills. To actually perform real work, there still needs to be a way to communicate with the rest of the system. To accomplish this, the SPU makes use of something known as DMA, Direct Memory Access. The DMA controller receives requests from programs and moves blocks of memory between main memory and the SPUs. The big pain point is that all of this is programmer managed. Let's talk about one last subject. I'm going to use Nier as an example again. This game has more than a few funky things hiding in its code. The game likes to sleep for 10 microseconds on the main thread. On Linux this works fine enough. We sleep for 10 microseconds. On Windows this becomes a bit of a problem, because the minimum amount of time we can sleep for is 500 microseconds. The solution is to busy wait. Keep the thread active and wait down the timer in user space instead. The problem is that this burns power, and doesn't let the operating system reschedule the thread elsewhere while waiting on the timer. There exists instructions that allow the processor to efficiently wait on a timer, without blowing up power usage. Historically, these instructions have only been available to the operating system, and normal programs can't execute them. Recently, however, AMD and Intel have added instructions that allow you to wait on a timer efficiently to user space. Thing is, this is one rare situation where AMD and Intel have implemented different instructions for the same purpose, so we need to write different paths for each brand this time. The good news is that using these instructions comes with a measurable performance and power draw improvement. It's about time to wrap up this video. I talked about a lot of stuff that I find exciting, but for each subject I touched upon, there were about 10 others that I admitted. I make contributions to the RPCS3 project, so what I want to speak about aligns with the kinds of things that I want to work on as well. But there are many other parts of the emulator that I don't work on, like the GPU emulation, which is full of just as much genius as the rest of the emulator. I'll leave some links in the description that cover some additional details on RPCS3, if you're curious. I wanted to cover some very technical subjects, but I also didn't want to spend time explaining some basics, like what a bit is, and so on. So I hope that I struck a good balance. If you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you could like and subscribe, as I do intend to create several more videos which may or may not be RPCS3 related. I'm between jobs at the moment, so I'd appreciate if you could share the video with as many people who you'd think would like it as you can. I don't intend to become a full-time YouTuber, but I don't have much else going on right now, so I do intend to make at least a couple more videos. Alright, peace out. See ya nerds!